Okay, good morning, um, and welcome to DrupalCon NOLA 2016 in New Orleans, U.S. This is the Drupal 8 Kickstart presentation and overview for developers. Um, my name is Peter Southchenetz, and I'm a senior uh, customer success engineer at Pantheon. Um, and Pantheon is a uh, website management platform, um, especially thoroughbred designed for Drupal and WordPress. Um, I have an opportunity uh, at this time to work with some giants in the industry here at Pantheon, and fortunately in my previous uh, positions, I've also had that same opportunity. Um, I started at about a year ago uh, looking into Drupal 8, and as I was doing it, I decided, you know, I might as well catalog like what I'm doing and document it, and then I turned it into a slideshow, and then I sent it out for a couple of proposals, and it got picked up at a whole bunch of uh, Drupal camps, including Bad Camp, and then it was accepted here at DrupalCon. So that's very nice. So what I wanted to preface it with is I move really fast through a lot of information. Um, I believe I have 75 slides. Um, but I, I assure you, everyone will come away um, knowing something that they didn't when they started, and I believe that you will pick up a lot of things like I did along the way. So. I start out by looking at some essential reading. And the uh, Drupal 8 API reference online on drupal.org, I would like to tell you is just an excellent reference. So if you're already quite a good Drupal 7 uh, developer, but you haven't really looked at Drupal 8 yet, if you were to read the Drupal 8 API documentation from top to bottom and follow a couple of links you know, deeper in as you go through each of the sections, you will come away with a really good picture of what you need to know for Drupal 8. So I highly advise looking at that um, at this time. The Programmer's Guide to Drupal from O'Reilly is extra interesting because it has D7 and D8 examples side by side, showing you how things were done in D7 and how they're being done in D8. And uh, if, that, if that could be good for you, it's an invaluable reference in that way. Online documentation, there is a lot. Um, a lot of it is out of date. Um, you know, Drupal was changing so fast through the alphas and the betas, and by the time it got uh, formally released, that I would, I'm comfortable saying anything older than December 2015 is probably not fully correct. Um, and you may not even notice uh, what could be wrong with it or what issues the documentation might have until later you try to do something. So that's why the Drupal 8 documentation on Drupal.org is really, really invaluable because it's very current. And so if you do read around online, just uh, keep an eye out on currency, that, that things are current. So uh, an interesting thing about Drupal 8, um, this is a bunch of, from my experience working on enterprise websites, this is the kind of products, uh, tools, libraries, or things that I've had to be conversant in, be able to configure, or be able to use in relationship to Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And so um, everything in this, side present this uh, slide presentation is uploaded uh, to the description of the session on the, on the DrupalCon website. Um, and everything that you see that looks like a link is linked to a very good resource that will tell you about this topic. So um, that's, this is the only time we're going to look at something uh, with this much hectic information in it. But like I'm saying, if there's anything in here that you haven't really read up on or that you're not conversant on, everything, knowing something about everything on this page will make you a more valuable adjunct in your business environment. So this is uh, the basic concept of Drupal 8, was to finally successfully separate data from presentation. And they have to great end achieve that in core. Uh, and most of the best contrib modules achieve that too. So you may have heard of headless Drupal. And all that headless Drupal means is you, you could use Drupal as a, up to that dotted line, which is only returning data. And you don't have any formatting in it at all. So that's the headless Drupal concept. So that's some Node.js application somewhere or some other website with an API could be calling into your website and only getting data back from Drupal. No presentation at all, no theme layer in use. So that's headless Drupal. But subsequently, when we get past the data, we want all the formatting to go on, where you're going to return the format that was requested, and coming from the other way is the request you know, coming in. So from 
Drupal 8's perspective and what they would hope you would design into your own module work as you go along is this same standard. Um, return data and then turn it into render arrays and format it in twig. But do not return HTML mixed with some data no matter what, no matter how little, no matter how major, no matter how complicated, try to do that. And then this way, in the future, whether you get an API call for your page or whether you get a browser call, whether you get it from mobile or the desktop, you're prepared because you can respond correctly in every way. Um, the idea also was to leverage existing industry standard technologies, um, recognized PHP frameworks using PHP object-oriented concepts. And so th to this end, uh, Drupal 8 is built on top of Symfony. Um, and it's just a side note uh, that at some point, Drupal 8, is, it, they're currently using Symfony 2.7. At some point, they plan to upgrade to Symfony 3. And so if in your module, you're actually uh, programming to Symfony, which you would be entitled to do, um, you should not program towards anything in Symfony that might get deprecated uh, going into Symfony 3. So some D8 essentials. Um, this again from my sort of hard won experience. This is uh, again concepts, software, or tools um, that you it, it, advisedly you should be familiar with if you're going to look at Drupal 8. So you have Composer, Drush, the Drupal console, Git and GitHub, YAML files, object oriented in PHP, comments and annotations, and getting more comfortable with testing if you haven't been doing testing. Um, and so I've written a lot of BHAT. I haven't written any uh, PHP unit, but I've written a lot of BHAT. And I can tell you, yeah, it is a bit of a grind, but uh, it does save you. When you finally make a change in the website and it breaks something over there that you didn't anticipate, you run your BHAT tests and so your BHAT test breaks. And you, and you know that, like every time you push something new, you run your tests and you don't need people, you don't need like the team testing pages. So I'm just gonna step through some of these items. So Composer is a dependency manager or a package manager, uh, relatively newer in PHP for pulling down the libraries and, and the tools that you need inside your website. So Drupal 8 can actually uh, use that. And when you install Drupal 8 today, after you download it and install it, you have to actually go into the doc root directory and run Composer install. And Composer install is actually gonna pull down Symfony and about 10 or 12 other related libraries into your Drupal site, into the vendor folder, and then that's where you're gonna have all of your adjunct libraries resident in the future, and you're advised to put yours there too, so that it's all centralized like that. And so Composer uses JSON files that have names of libraries or tools that you wanna download with the version that you would like to get, um, and maybe some other information. And when you say composer install, it goes into that JSON file, it grabs everything you said that you wanted, goes out to the repositories, pulls everything in, and installs it for you. So that's what composer does, and if you haven't uh, looked at it or used it, I can highly recommend it. So, and over here, just to um, you know, show an example, uh, that directory there, which happens to be called resources, but it could also be vendor, um, you can see that has like 15, um, PHP libraries and adjuncts that have been pulled in to support a single website. So if you were downloading all of these on your own, you know, you would be going and installing them and configuring them. With Composer, you get that one JSON file together and you just pull all of this down with one command called Composer install. Later, if you want to stay current with every one of these libraries, like you're not concerned about being locked into a certain old version, you can just run Composer update It'll go out, it'll look at every repository, and it'll go, wow, there's a new version, pull it down for you. You can say, pull down dev, even. I'm, I'm so, I wanna stay so on the edge that even pull down dev versions for me if they're there. Or, on the other hand, in your JSON lock file, you can go in and say, do not update this particular library beyond this version. And then when you do composer update, it'll leave those for you, and it'll only update the ones you have not indicated so. So Composer Manager is a Drupal 8 module that allows you to actually make these kind of updates through the Drupal 8 admin interface. Um, and so you can look this up and download it and install it, and it gives you a very nice graphical admin interface, and I highly recommend looking at it. Drush, I'm gonna assume everybody in here uses Drush because it looks like a good team, uh, but if not, 
Um, you should start using DRUS immediately. I estimate from my experience, again, that it will increase your Drupal admin time by three to ten times um, over going into the admin to do things. Um, I used to have a big page of uh, Drush command, example Drush commands, but uh, take it from me, if you haven't used Drush, you can log in, you can make users, delete users, you can uh, you know, create features, update features, um, install modules, uninstall modules, run ad hoc SQL queries against the database, everything through Drush, and it's really excellent. And you can install Drush using Composer, very nice. The, the Drupal console, this is um, an item that some people are saying, wow, this is a lot like Drush. Why do they ex both exist? But Drupal Console actually um, is another app. You download it. You can install it individually into every Drupal website you have, or you can install it globally for your entire uh, work environment. But in Drupal Console, you can go make me a brand new module scaffold, and it will create a big blank Drupal 8 module scaffold with all the correct YAML files in place, the directory structure pre-built for you, sample class files started up for you. It's really brilliant. Uh, I highly recommend you download and get comfortable with this uh, tool immediately for Drupal 8. Um, and on top of that, it can introspect your website showing you every route that is inside your website and every module that is you know, uh, handling that route and it can show you many other uh, configurations about Drupal 8 and it can exec execute some admin tasks for you. And then again, a bunch of good links on how to use it. Uh, version control, I'm sure you're all using version control of, of some kind. If not, these are the tools to look at, Git, GitHub and Bitbucket, and there's actually um, a next level Git session uh, that you could still attend uh, here at DrupalCon if you wanna uh, just jump deep into Git immediately. YAML files. So all the configuration that Drupal used to hide in the database, which actually it technically still does, but now it puts them, and I'll explain, uh, now puts them into YAML files, and YAML is a recursive acronym for YAML ain't markup language. Uh, basically, YAML looks like JSON. So but what happens now is when you make a module and you want to have some default settings for your module on the admin page, you're going to have those in, an ad, in a YAML file and when you enable your module, Drupal's gonna go in there, and if you have default settings, it'll read them out, and it'll put them in the database for you. Um, so a couple of interesting things about it um, is that it is case sensitive, and you should use two spaces when you're indenting, and you should not use tabs. Uh, there are other frameworks where the standard for YAML files is four spaces to create indenting, but in Drupal it is two. Um, and you can even make um, schema files for your YAML files, uh, like you can do with XML. So this is what a sample YAML file looks like. This is actually the core services YAML file. Um, and so uh, basically, if you, we skip that top part with parameters and we go to services, you know, it is defining services that are available in Drupal. And so that first one is called you know, cache context uh, by IP and then it, it notes the class that handles this particular service, arguments that it accepts by default when it is instantiated, and tags is like the group of technology that it belongs to within Drupal. So we're just gonna quick look at classes. So classes is a group of methods and properties organized in a file that offer a service or do something. So um, how I uh, explain this concept for people who are new uh, to OOP is that, um, you know, in PHP you have include and require, and, you, and that's how you bring in extra technology from other PHP files. Well, in classes, it, instead of having include and require, you have a use directive. So you might have a file, and at the top it's going to say use such and such class. And then you can be using, like, five different classes all of that technology in this file. So use a class is the same as include a file. Um, and now you can access all of the methods and the properties that are inside that class that you said I want to use in this file. So in Drupal, all controllers, routers, forms, and plugins are all actually class files. Um, and they use each other extensively, and you'll see that. Um, and so in general, all the functionality created in Drupal 8 and including in your custom modules is going to be created in class files. 
Um, there really is no other way. Um, as, it, as it works, as the framework works now in Drupal 8, it reads through all your modules, it looks for an expected directory structure that indicates to the framework what you're trying to offer, then it looks for certain types of files within those directory structures, and then it looks for a certain type of class construction inside those files. When any part of your module construction does not meet those standards, you'll have a fatal error or your technology will go unrecognized. So um, essentially what's happening in Drupal 8, uh, you know how in Drupal 7, you know, someone will do it in an include file or in an admin form include file and you could find technology in like five different places. That's just not going to be the way, like you could build a block anywhere you felt like it. Um, that is not how it's arranged in Drupal 8. Um, a block is expected to be in a plugin directory in a class file with certain three um, methods inside of it that build that block and you have to have it that way or you will not have a block. So an interface is a special kind of class um, that it says here um, has empty default methods inside. And so if you want to uh, say there is a class that says, you know, I'm an email service and I'm an interface and I have five methods inside me. But you want to create your own custom um, interface or uh, emailer. So you use this interface and now you can take all of its methods and in fact you must use all of its methods but then you change all the insides in those methods and that's how you make your own custom emailer based on an emailer interface. And so when you look around in Drupal you'll see that everything, every service that Drupal Core offers starts as an interface they build the interface and then Drupal uses its own interfaces in classes to provide you services. And so down below along the bottom you implement an interface but you extend an abstract class. So an abstract class is similar to an interface. It offers a bunch of methods but you are not obligated to use them when you extend an abstract class. So again like I said you know I'm moving through a lot of stuff. Um, we can't go into the specifics of everything, but I'm confident that you'll be going right, I see, and that later when you see this structure inside Drupal when you're looking around, you'll recall this information. A trait, and there are trait files in Drupal, is a group of uh, functions that do a lot of the same thing. So they've been conveniently put into a single file so that uh, they're organized. And classes can use traits to get the functionality out of traits. And that is, that is how it is actually done in Drupal. So PHP uh, object-oriented reading. There's two, I have two links here, PHP Freaks and Java 2s. Um, these are pretty old, like 2008, 2010. They've been online for a long time. But these are excellent if, you, if you're just starting in object-oriented and you want like a really excellent intro, both of these uh, pages will get you started. There's also an object-oriented session coming up that you can still attend here, and it looks like really good. Dependency injection. So this is a big thing in Drupal 8. It's in use in a lot of other uh, frameworks. But essentially what dependency injection is, um, you have a class. Again, it sends email. But how it sends email, right, is, could vary. You could use an SMTP server, you can use a POP3 server, right? You could use some other strategy. When you build your class and you go and you hard code inside, oh, every time someone wants to use the email service, I'm gonna use SMTP, this class is now a little too brittle because it's always using SMTP. So you can say, okay, someone will send in a parameter and I'll do a check and if they say SMTP, I'll use that. If they say POP3, I'll use POP3. So then again, now every time you introduce a new kind of uh, mechanism for sending email, you gotta go into the class and change the, the if structure the, or the case structure and you're, and you're rewriting. So with dependency injection, you actually tell the class when you instantiate it, I wanna use SMTP as the service. And so you tell the class what you want it to use to do its work and it just takes that and does the work using what you, you told it to do. That is essentially, in the shortest possible amount of words, what dependency injection is. It is used pervasively throughout Drupal 8. 
You're going to see it everywhere. And so in class files, at least in PHP, there's a certain function called construct that is uh, headed by two uh, double underscore. So construct is the method that fires immediately, automatically, as soon as you instantiate a class. And that is where you can expect any parameters that have been passed in to be when, they, when, when your class gets instantiated. So when you're writing your class and someone has passed in parameters, it is in the construct function where you can expect to find them and immediately work on them and evaluate them and do things you need. This, is, this dependency injection article by Fabian is super excellent. It does happen to be four sections, four pages long, and it's extremely technical. But if you want the total lowdown on dependency injection from A to Z, that article will give it to you. So services are classes. Um, we've been calling them objects for years, but in Drupal they want to call it a service because it does something for you, and you can go and take that service from that class. Uh, and so anyway, th that's going to be a class file. Your plugins, which, which make blocks and support views and, and things like that, these are all going to be class files also. Comments and special comments called annotations. Now, um, you know, I've seen a lot of code, I've written a lot of code, and I know that writing comments and writing truly accurate comments according to the standards that comments are supposed to meet uh, can be consuming, can even seem like tiny, uh, taxing, and I just don't want to do it. Well, in Drupal 8, um, self-documentation is actually pulled out of your comments. So when your comments are structured correctly, according to how Drupal wants to see them, it can create documentation um, as it reads through everything uh, out of your comments. Annotations are actually special comments with special formatting that Drupal actually reads and other frameworks do. They read through your annotations for you to tell the framework what your technology does. And if your annotations are not correct, your technology is misunderstood. So in Drupal 8, it is still plausible to get by with not writing the correct comments, but like in plugins where annotations are expected, your annotations must be accurate because they are describing to the framework what my plugin does. So I have the special links down there. Both of those articles are really excellent about how you format uh, comments and annotations um, in Drupal. So I highly recommend it. This is just a couple of uh, offbeat items, method chaining. You know, like we've all seen that. If you look at that example across the bottom, that's from jQuery. Everybody's seen that kind of thing, right, where multiple commands are just chained together. Um, and for the longest time, I never really understood exactly what it was or what it was called. And it's actually called method chaining. And the reason why it works, why jQuery can take the edit button change its color, slide it up and slide it down all in one long command is because every one of those commands, CSS or slide up or slide down, actually returns the entire edit button object again. And so that's why every method in the chain can work successfully on the object because it keeps getting returned by every method in that chain. So you've seen uh, method chaining on multi-line like that, and that's a D8 example. I know you've seen that in Drupal 7 or 8, multi-line method chaining. But that is what's going on there. DB update is like the object, and then it's executing condition on it, which returns the object again, which executes fields on it, which returns the object again, and then it is finally executed. So that's what's going on in method chaining. Um, short array syntax, since PHP 4, and in use throughout Drupal 8, is the short array syntax. You're probably familiar with this too. Um, and I never knew what these were called, but I had to look them up. So when you, when you uh, define an array with the parentheses like that, that is called a constructor function. But if you just use those two braces, which it equals the same thing, that's the short array syntax. So I'm showing you the examples there. Um, so this is not like anything uh, very mysterious. But I did want to tell you, you'll see this everywhere in Drupal 8. There are almost no um, array constructions using the old style technique. They're all using um, the new short array syntax. Type hinting. Um, type hinting is when, uh, and you, I'm sure you've seen it, and you've probably used it, um, but if you write a function and the parameter coming in, you need it to be an array, or it must be a Boolean or it has to be an SMTP object. 
So right in front of it, in the function, you describe what should this variable be, be on the way in. So like in the first example, I'm saying page has to be an array to come in here. And in the second example, it's saying event has to be a filter, respons filter response object on the way in. So, and when you do this, when you do type hinting, PHP handles the validation for you. And if someone does try to send you a page item that is not an array, PHP will throw the fatal error and stop it and very succinctly say line 98, file such and such, you know, not the right type. And so you don't have to handle that, go in there and write the if statement, you know, the endless possibilities. Maybe they sent an array or a Boolean or a blank or a null. Uh, PHP will handle that for you. So I highly recommend type hinting if you're not using it yet and explore it. Now we get to Drupal 8. Um, this is, uh, again, this is my crib notes. This may not work in your environment exactly, but it can. This is installing Drupal 8 from the command prompt, uh, cloning it right out of the uh, Drupal git repo, um, immediately creating um, you know, a new tag off of it. Uh, making the files uh, structure that's needed, uh, setting up services YAML and settings PHP, preparing them to be written to by the Drupal install, um, and then changing them back to secure settings, and then after all that happens, running composer install, which is gonna pull down Symfony and all the things that belong in the vendor folder. Um, again, this is available as a reference. Further, with a couple of more commands, you can pair, prepare Drupal 8 for debugging, which is really nice. So what you tell it to do in your settings PHP file, you tell it, you, you uh, uncomment a single line that says, oh, if you find a local settings PHP file at the peer level with me, please pull that in. And in that local settings PHP file, there's a bunch of directives to Drupal that says, hey, if you're gonna throw errors, throw them in a really verbose, more regular English fashion and then your debugging when you have errors is gonna be more clear um, and more specific uh, because of that change. And then of course you need to change that back of course when you go up to test and go up to live. And then the final one is uh, using Drush to enable the Devel module. And here's a beautiful thing about Devel in Drupal 8. They added a new tool in there called the Web Profiler. Um, and so what the Web Profiler does when it's enabled on every single page, you're gonna get this like little toolbar across the bottom, and it will tell you everything. It's like an x-ray of this page. Every controller that was called and used to build this page, every theme, every set of functions, every MySQL query, everything that happened to build this page can be found in these little icons across the bottom. You can actually link then into a deeper report where you can get like a report version and everything is linked. Like if it says, I use this controller, it's actually linked to it inside the Drupal 8 site. So you can navigate to the controller that handled this page directly. So that's the web profiler portion of the Devel module uh, in Drupal 8. I believe they're backporting it to Drupal 7 or it is already in Drupal 7. Um, this is just a quick look of what the top level directory structure looks like in Drupal 8 after it's installed. The only thing that's really important is that the modules directory is now at the top level in Drupal 8. It isn't down. Um, so, and this is actually where you're gonna be putting your contrib modules and your custom modules is right here in the top level modules directory. Everything that is in core, that belongs to core, is now in this core directory and is not located any place else in the site. So, and then uh, themes is where your themes are gonna go. Vendor is the vendor directory I've been talking about where all the supporting libraries, including Symfony, are pulled in. And then the sites directory is still the sites directory. If you need to make you know, uh, extra sites, uh, whatever you're doing for multiple themes, you can still use the sites directory for that. And in fact, settings PHP is still located in sites default. This is what's inside the core directory. Um, again, this is really just here for a reference. Um, and now this is what um, I'm suggesting to you. Uh, this is not being uh, forced on you, but I've been in enough environments to suggest this, that once you get inside the modules directory, you should make subdirectories called contrib and custom. And there's actually some modules that look for this. And then so all the contrib modules that you download, you put in the contrib directory, and all of your custom modules for your site, you put in the custom directory. And this way, 
there's no doubt, am I looking at a contrib module or am I looking at something we built? And this distinction helps you have that immediately. Um, this is a typical Drupal 8 module structure. At the topmost level, there's a bunch of YAML files. Then there's a config directory and a source. So in that config directory is the YAML file that's going to have your default uh, you know, um, settings that you would like when the module is enabled. And then in source is everything else that you have built for this module, all of your class files. Um, so, and again, this is not an optional uh, style of formatting your module directory. This is mandatory because the framework is going to look in your source directory and it wants to know, do you have an event subscriber going on? Do you have a form going on? If they're not located in this directory structure, it won't get found. So that's, you know, that's really the purpose of that. So YAML files. Um, back in Drupal 7, on the right-hand side, uh, everything that used to be in the .info file is now in the .info YAML file, and everything is prefaced by your module name uh, for organizational purposes. Every hook menu is now in the routing YAML file. Every hook menu where you wanted something to show up in the admin section of Drupal is in links menu YAML. Your permissions in permissions YAML. And then you have your services YAML to describe the services that your module is going to offer. So, and this is a quick look at what a services YAML file might look like in your module. You can offer several services, which is what's going on here. Um, the first thing is it's got to say, hey, I'm offering services. So that's the first top level item. This is a service whose machine name is Tracking Inject Manager. It is being actually handled when it's called for by the Tracking Inject Manager class. And then it accepts a database as a parameter. And it's tagged as backend overridable. So that's essentially what you're going to see in a services YAML file. The bootstrap, here's what's going on when Drupal bootstraps, right? It reads settings PHP, it generates some other settings. Uh, it uh, starts up the class loader to start reading through the framework and getting all your classes, uh, sets up an error handler, and then it detects if Drupal is actually installed, creates the Drupal kernel, and initializes the service container. So the service container is what Drupal uses. It goes and it reads through core, and it finds everything core offers, it, offers to you and puts it actually into like a gigantic object, basically and it says this is everything that Drupal offers to this website. So, and we'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more. So then it adds the container into the static classes, it attempts to serve your page from the cache, loads all the variables, loads other include files, registers stream wrappers, creates the HTTP request object, lets the Drupal kernel handle it and return a response, and then it terminates the request. Okay, um, if uh, you, know, you know hooks, so there are some hooks remain in Drupal 8, but most of them have been removed in favor of an event uh, model, and you subscribe to events. So these are a couple of very good links that describe that for you, um, and I'm just going to uh, enumerate here the, the main events that the Drupal 8 kernel offers. There's the controller event, which is the, the time when your request at such and such URL gets met by a class to respond to it. When that happens, the controller event fires. If there was a mistake, you get an exception event. When the request is finished, a finished request, the initiation of the request, the response, termination of this entire act, and view. So this is just an interesting side note here. If your, re if your response terminates and Drupal is hanging there and says, wow, I can't figure out what you're returning. I don't know if you really returned an array or if you returned a response object. It will actually, in a final effort called the view event, try to turn it into something that it feels it can return. And it can grab an array at that point and process it as if it's a render array and try to turn it into HTML and present it to the user. So that's what view is doing there at the end. Um, this is an example event subscriber. Um, so what's going on in an event subscriber, so this is where you used to say, hey, hook init, right? Hook bootstrap. So instead, you're going to subscribe to those events I just described. So, and you're going to make a class. It's going to be in an event subscriber folder inside your source directory. When you make this class, it's actually implementing the event subscriber interface, so you must use all the methods that are in that interface. 
And the first method is um, to tell it what event you would like to subscribe to. In this particular case, it's the request event. And then that array after that is saying, run the initiate tracking function, which is inside this class on the request event. And then inside the initiate tracking, it actually gets the response event as an object passed into it. And then in this particular case, commented out, it's, uh, it could, um, you know, it's writing, you know, it's echoing something to the screen, um, or you could actually take actions. That is predominantly how hooks are being treated now in Drupal 8, changed instead to event subscribing. Uh, core functionality in Drupal 8, such as the current user, current path, node info, who's logged in, does a module exist? All of these you get out of the core service object that I described earlier, where everything is packed into one um, big object, and that object is actually called Drupal, as you can see at the end. Um, backslash Drupal will get you access to everything that Drupal has created in this particular bootstrap. So an example would be I grab Drupal, I get its module handler method, and then off of that I say, you know, uh, I want to check for module exists, and I'm checking for the content translation module. And this is going to return true or false. So if I want to get the current user, I set account equal to Drupal, get me the current user. I want to get a piece of configuration, I say Drupal, get me the config of some, mo of some module name, and get me its settings. And you're going to get a settings array back from that module out of which you can cherry pick what you need to use. Uh, other examples of using Drupal core services, this is to get, the second line is to get the request object, um, to get the exceptions off the uh, request object, to get the status code um, off the exception. Okay, so um, everything that you used to remember from the conf um, and everything you used to use variable get and variable set for, that is all uh, changed to this type of get from config and write to config. So this is actually like a pretty sophisticated topic and it would, have, it would be a whole show on its own to go through all the variations on configuration and grabbing settings and saving settings. So, but I'm just like telling you, it's a big concept and down, down here at the end is a, is, a, is a nice example where you're using the Drupal uh, core object and you're saying, please from the config of the system, please get me page front. And this is how you're going to get the home page um, if you need to grab the home page. Um, some more things, you know, getting variables and setting variables. So you cannot actually set a variable in the same simple way that you read it. Um, you have to uh, instantiate a config factory, get the editable version of the setting you would like to change, then change it and save it. And if you don't do all of those steps, you know, your change to that setting will not happen correctly. Um, and then down below is unsetting a variable by using the clear method on it and then saving the fact that you have cleared that variable. So, um, yeah, again, some more uh, reiteration of types of getting settings and setting settings. Okay, so caching. Uh, caching. If you haven't looked into it deeply, I know it can seem like really a lot of work, again, similar to comments. Okay, but for anybody who is not uh, completely uh, clued in on caching and hasn't studied it a little bit, you're gonna have to. As you move into enterprise environments, there's just no way around it. You will become, you will be talking caching every single day, nonstop. It, um, it is the only way that large-scale websites that get thousands and hundreds of thousands of hits and millions of hits can actually survive that experience and get pages out. They have to be cached. So um, basically there's two things about caching. You know, you got to cache something and then you have to invalidate it when it's gotten too old and you want to refresh it and it needs to be new. So that's the two basic concepts. I cache things by saving things in, and then I invalidate them by removing them out of the cache. And there's just a nice quote here from uh, Wim Weers, who talks about 
it, and I thought it was very good, so I just put it in there. Um, you know, someone can, you can read that. So here is other key concepts about caching. Like I said, we can't go into all of them, but I've given you some really good links, and there's a big pipe session that you can still attend also. But this is all the key sort of things you should know about caching in Drupal 8 if you can take the time to read on these topics. And, and newest is the one that's linked on the top called the big pipe. And here's an example of big pipe. So borrowing from Facebook, what Drupal 8 is doing for you, um, when you do all of your caching correctly, uh, and your module uses the caching model in Drupal 8 correctly, you can cache you know, little portions of your page. You can cache a block, you can cache a section, you can cache the footer, all differently from the cache status of the entire page. So when Drupal builds your page and it looks at all the granularity of your caching, it actually keeps track of all of it for you. And then it says, wow, I, I believe I can deliver the framework of this page 100% cached, as I'm showing here on the left side, all that gray matter, with only three items uncached because I followed all of your tags. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to deliver the entire cached framework really fast to the user and they're going to get a page up. You know, and there's going to be spinners and little pieces waiting, which you've you know, all seen. So then, in the big pipe concept, Drupal will continue to stream the uncached portions into the page, much like an Ajax command, um, where you, you know, after the page loads, you use Ajax to pull in more stuff. This is essentially an Ajax technique, but it's being done by keeping your HTTP connection open and continuing to pipe things up into the browser. So now these uh, extra units are piped in that were dynamic and not cacheable. They come together at the end, finished page for the user. That's the concept of big pipe. Um, this is a fairly technical explanation, which I borrowed right out, off of Drupal.org. But I found that this particular little section um, explains caching in Drupal 8 about as thoroughly and succinctly as it could be done. So I put it here for you. Um, cache contexts. Um, when the thing you're caching is going to change because of language or cookies or a route or because of a session or a change theme or something changes in the URL or there's something different about the user, you can tag your render array to say my cache context is to change on user. And then so Drupal will know if user has changed, I need to render this piece individually again for this user, and it will not send accidentally the cached version from the previous user. So again, if you're tagging all of your cached things correctly, you can have this kind of granularity throughout your caching uh, in Drupal 8. Uh, you can also just cache things and then invalidate them based on a time. You can say every five minutes, every hour, every three days. Um, you can set it, I believe, to zero for it never it never expires. And so you can have a cache get invalidated because the user changes or the URL changes, or you can have a cache invalidate in five minutes. And you can do both of them at the same time. So that uh, if the user doesn't change, but five minutes will go by, the cache will get destroyed and it'll get rebuilt on the next request anyway. So um, now here's a render array. Now when you make a block through the block plugin, you don't have to but Drupal 8 is really requesting that your block output will be in this type of render array example that you're seeing here, and that you would not return a string of HTML combined with uh, data. So um, when you look at this render array, you can see that caching has a prominent top-level key, and all the things that can help um, add the granularity to the change and expiration and invalidation of your caching can be supplied here. So this render array basically under context is saying if the user changes, this render array has to be rendered again. Um, if we look at tags, it's actually saying if node 42 in English changes, this render array has to change here again and has to be invalidated and rerun. If something changes in the config system performance section, this cache has to be invalidated and built again. Um, and then you see it has max age 300, which I think is like milliseconds, so I don't know what is that, that's like three minutes or five minutes. So, and then, so then it's saying, or 
If max age is more than five minutes, this render array has to be invalidated and rebuilt. So that is how you put the granularity into all of your output. And then in this render array are all those other details, like you can put a prefix in front of your output, you can have markup in your output, you can have a suffix after it, you can have a theme that works on this render array that you can indicate, you can fire off a pre-render function which will process the info that's getting passed into this render array for you again before you use it, if that's what you need. And then mo most importantly is this attached feature down here. When you need to include custom CSS or custom JS just for your little block that you're loading with this render array, you attach it here. And then when you attach it this way, instead of putting it in hook and knit or trying to put it in your theme file or something like that, and then it gets loaded on every page for no reason, Drupal will look at this and go, only on pages where this block is actually loaded will I include this CSS and this JS. And that's how you get your granularity. And you don't have to have if statements all over your website saying, you know, if it's in, you know, a user section, please include this JS, et cetera, et cetera. You do it here and you can have very granular inclusion of your JS and CSS. Uh, this is a really quick look at Twig. Um, and how variables are output in Twig, they're inside double braces, how um, conditional logic looks, uh, filters, attributes, and just uh, mo importantly, when you put um, uh, in, um, a variable in the middle of some HTML, you don't leave a space. They don't expect you to leave any spaces around the braces. It's just supposed to touch and be sort of like uh, continuous. So again, uh, you know, you can look at this uh, in your own time. So the routing system in D8 is uh, basically like I had started to discuss earlier. If you have a path in your website, um, you know, forward slash contact. Um, so that goes into your routing YAML file and in there it says when someone asks for forward slash contact, execute this class. And so that's basically what we're explaining here. And then this is so what your routing YAML file will look like that achieves that. Um, Right away in the, in the routing YAML file for your module, your route is going to have a machine name and it, typically we would prefer that it, is, um, it has your module name and then a period and then the name of the route. So then it is followed by the path that, you know, that responds to this. Here's the controller that gets executed on this request and on top of that, after that double colon, it's actually saying go into that class and execute this method on this particular controller call. Um, and then this is the title of the page and this is the permissions to access this page. There may be a few other attributes that you can put in here, but this is your basics. And this is how you create a custom route for a single URL that your module is gonna control or respond to. So this is a very good link to a, a very high quality look at how to make a block plugin correctly really quick. Um, and so like I told you, that is a class file with three methods you must use that are located in the source directory in the plugins folder under that. And that's where your blocks have to be to get recognized by the system. Uh, the configuration management initiative um, if you've done a lot of Drupal 7, you probably know you've saved features, right? And then you've taken them over to, um, to live, and then you've imported them into live, and then you had feature conflicts, and, and you find that you're exporting content and names of nodes and things which, you know, features was not designed for. And then you know, that's getting mixed up with true admin settings that you do want to move from dev to live, and you get a lot of potential aggravation. So in the content management initiative, Drupal is handling all this for you. Drupal will basically scour your entire website and go, I found every piece of admin setting that you've got and I'm gonna export it as a YAML file and save it in the defaults files directory under some cryptic uh, just invented long name that's like unguessable. Um, probably a UUID I believe is what it uses. So and then, you can actually put that in Git or however you're going to get it to your live site and now on the live site you can go please import that config and everything that just got exported out of dev or out of test will get pulled into live. So no using features to do it, no hand transcribing, no putting commands in your modules to create uh, admin settings. You just export them all with one click and then you import them with another click at the, at the target website. 
So, and to make that even nicer, um, there's a configuration inspector module for Drupal 8 that will, after you install it, analyze all your config and put it in a beautiful admin page report linked to all the admin pages who's creating all these config settings and show you all the config settings from all of these modules. It is extremely handy if you need to x-ray a site. So for example, you come to a new Drupal 8 site you don't know anything about, you quick install this module, you go to its report page and you see everything that's getting built and has settings in this website. Very cool. The Drupal module upgrader. Um, I've never used this product, but it has really good reviews when you read about it. So um, you can actually, you'll install this module, point it at your existing Drupal 7 module, and it will make its best effort to convert it into a Drupal 8 module on the fly for you. Um, so I'm sure you've seen concepts like that of turning D6 modules into D7 modules, and you know that, that your mileage may vary. So your mileage may vary here too, but this will at least get you started. Um, and I used a technique like this once to go from D6 to D7. So not only did it achieve like 80% of it, the other 20% it was like, hey, this is the part I can't convert. And like right here, this was the function I could not convert. You're going to have to finish this yourself. And it was like really accurate. And it turned like a huge time consuming chore into like a one day effort. And so it's possible that this could do this for you. Uh, simple test and PHP unit testing in Drupal 8. Um, so like I was talking about, I'm just kind of doing this sort of like as an evangelist. Um, again, like I indicated, I am not a totally a testing expert, but I've been in, in enough environments and around enough jobs to tell you that testing eventually is going to come up, testing is eventually going to be important, and testing is eventually going to be vital. So um, simple test is the, is the module and the strategy that is still used in Drupal 8 for creating interface testing, basically where like, you want to check does the login work when, when the fields are filled in and someone hits submit. If someone puts in bad fields, does it break or does it show the message? You can use simple tests to achieve that kind of testing. PHP unit testing, on the other hand, would be you write a module and the module is supposed to turn back, uh, return centigrade when Fahrenheit is passed in. So you write a PHP unit test that sends in uh, valid centigrade, sends in words, you know, or strings, right? Sends in whole sentences, and you see how does your module end up responding. And then if it breaks, because it's sent in a string and you're not checking for that, you know you need to fix that. So and that's the type of checking you can do with PHP unit. Um, and so with PHP unit, you can also, like, uh, using dependency injection, and this is where dependency injection becomes very valuable and is actually at its like um, best usage case. So remember like we were saying, okay, you've got this email class and you want to tell it when I instantiate you, use SMTP and you inject it into the module. So now say you're on a dev environment that doesn't even have a connection to the internet. Um, what you can do instead is you can build a dummy function that says, oh, I got an email address, parse it correctly, oh, it has an attachment, parse that correctly too, and then if you have success, return true. And you can call that my testing emailer object. And so when you go to test your emailing, instead of passing in a real SMTP service object, you pass in your testing SMTP service object. And if your testing uh, injected item works, you know your thing is working. Um, and then you can purposely break it with this testing item and see how your uh, product r responds when you purposely break it. Um, so that's uh, where dependency injection like really shines and why in large environments you're gonna see dependency injection in use. I have a couple of handy links uh, to PHP unit and to testing in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 and those are very good links. It is possible that in the near future, and there's discussion about it, about putting bhat, the Drupal extension, the mink extension, mink, goot, and possibly phantom JS all into Drupal 8. And this is another uh, strategy for testing the interface of your website. Um, and what, but what this provides is through bhat and the Drupal extension and the mink extension, and say something like phantom JS, you can write a test that says, hey, crack open, a, 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 an invisible browser, Phantom JS, 
go to this page on my website, fill in the form, hit submit, test all these Drupal functions on it, see if I got success, and call that a test. Because the Drupal extension will allow you to call like Drupal functions from inside your BHAT tests. It's actually like really slick once you like understand the concept. And then you can write very elegant, sophisticated tests uh, against your site using this great combination of um, JavaScript and deep Drupal. So, but this is just a dialogue, and, um, but you can do it yourself. Like you can set all this up on your own website um, and run it all yourself. So um, a quick note here. Uh, you saw from the beginning, you know, the big ecosystem that comes with a Drupal 8 website, potentially. Um, you know, Varnish, Caching, Nginx, like Splunk, Jenkins, everything, all these things operating on your website and your website environment. Um, so today, there are several uh, services that allow you to basically roll out a Drupal 8 website with a click of a button. Um, and one of them does happen to be Pantheon. Um, and from this perspective, uh, how this could be looked at is just like Drupal has gone outside and said, look, I use product that is proudly invented elsewhere to build a better website. So you could use a platform like Pantheon to build a better website without you having to have to build the entire server structure yourself and have three or four people rolling it out and maintaining it. Instead, you buy as a service the platform that runs Drupal for you. Um, so I can tell you from having been on the outside and on the inside, there are a lot of very nice advantages to having your Drupal platform as a service um, and having all of that off your back and having excellent tech support to call and say, you know, why is that not working? And, you know, instead of like, you're up tonight between 11 p.m. and 3 o'clock in the morning figuring it out yourself, um, et cetera. Uh, so there is actually a, 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 a website called Try Drupal where there's several um, uh, Drupal platform as a service uh, tests available. And in particular, in the one on Pantheon, you can set up an account for free, spin up a Drupal 8 website, start installing modules on it, start testing it, hit it, create it, break it, use it, and it's all free. Um, training resources, I've done a lot of reading um, ahead for you. Um, if you haven't ever looked at Drupalize Me, Build a Module, KNP University, these are all uh, endless amounts of video tutorials uh, on Drupal 8, Drupal 7, related technologies. Some of these are free. Some of these cost 20 bucks a month for unlimited access. So if you have not, uh, in your career, uh, spent money on yourself education-wise, I can tell you that a $20 subscription to one of these websites and you go on there and watch 10 videos over three weeks' time, you will get your money's worth. Um, Safari Books Online, uh, similar thing. I don't know if it's nine bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. You actually have digital access to every book O'Reilly has ever done on programming. So in a month, you need to get up on Java. <laughs> you pay 20 bucks to Safari. Uh, you, know, you grab three or four Java books digitally, read all the parts of it that are important to you, on every, any device you want to, anytime you want, for 20 bucks a month. It's real, if you need to catch up on something, this is a technique. Um, I didn't know this until a while back, and someone enlightened me, though. But basically, every uh, presentation ever given at a DrupalCon event uh, has been recorded and is stored on YouTube under the Drupal Association channel. Um, and so you can see a lot of really valuable educational work. And that is the end. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think there actually is time for questions. If anybody wants to ask a question, I think we have three minutes. Um, but I find that nobody really has the wherewithal to do it. <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in 7, used to, there was the libraries directory. Yes. Um, is the vendor director and composer going to replace that, or do they still both exist? Is there some... They actually still both exist, right? Okay. But I think the idea is we would really like your custom module and everybody's contrib module to put it in vendor. Okay. Yeah. And then use composer to manage composer it. Composer to download there. the dependencies. Right. Cool. And you can put your own composer JSON file in your module that would get used to deploy, deploy. and maintain it correctly as you need it. Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. 
Hello. Oh. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Um, so you talked a little bit at the beginning about the headless Drupal. Right. Um, are there any like uh, SDKs available for any other languages in terms of, or even PHP, for interacting with Drupal, or is it just through the REST API for right now? You know, I think someone made a mobile like SDK for like Sensio or somebody for talking to Drupal in, in headless mode. But otherwise, I think it's basically it's roll your own. Yeah. Okay. So, um, on top of that, uh, is it so? Can you can access nodes? Can you access like view results, like paging wise? Like what what is available? Is everything available via the REST API, basically? Yes. That's a great answer. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the structure of namespace for contributed modules. In particular, I believe it's Drupal, and then you skip the source directory, and then it's everything below that as, as a namespace. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And, and that's so easy to reference. And in fact, what I could tell you is I wanted to mention this to everybody. The Google Analytics module, the contrib Google Analytics module, is just like an excellent example of everything to do correct in a new Drupal 8 module. And you can look in there and look at the site structure and the how things are included and everything, and you'll have it very accurately from there. Great. Well, I got to tell you, Pete, great job. It was a whirlwind information. Um, I was following along with the slides I downloaded from the, the link in the description. I don't know if you made some updates recently. But I the, did, like, okay, yeah. this morning at 8.30. Right. If you could push that other file, it would be fantastic, because that's like a survival guide. Right. Just the, one it. From, awesome. the, the one since about 8.30 this morning is completely current. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, great. Thank you.